Just a heads up, today's episode doesn't get into anything graphic, but should be said that we do discuss some mature themes. He can be so mean and so funny. Welcome to another episode of The Book Isn't Necessarily Better, a podcast from the Community Library Network. I'm your host, Michaela. And I'm Roxanne. Today we're talking about literary bad boy Truman Capote and his classic novella, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Take it away, Roxanne. All right. I am excited to talk about Breakfast at Tiffany's and more excited to talk about Truman Capote. (laughs) The train wreck that is Truman Capote. (laughs) <laughs> oh, Truman. Well, I'm going to start with a biography of Truman Capote, mm-hmm. the diminutively statured, <laughs> the diminu, the diminuli, nope, <laughs> the small statured man <laughs> standing at only five foot four and lover of amazing clothes. Mm-hmm. Truman Capote was born in New Orleans, Louisiana in 1924. He was born as Truman Strickfus Persons. Excuse me? His middle name is Struckfuss. <laughs> and what does that mean? Where's that from? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, he had a, a really challenging childhood. His father was called Arch, and he was a petty criminal. He was in and out of jail. He actually came from a, a pretty high-ranking family. He married Lily May, his mom, who got pregnant when she was 19. His parents got divorced when he was four, and Lily May was pretty neglectful, and he would deal with abandonment issues his entire life. When he was little, his mom dropped him off with relatives in Alabama, and so he would deal for the rest of his life with pretty intense trauma from having a mother who would often lock him up while she went out with men. Because of this, he had a complicated relationship with women in general. But when he lived in Alabama, he lived with, you know, some sort of distant relatives. And because Truman knew that he was gay from childhood, he didn't always fit into a pretty rigid social system. And sometimes he could be an outcast. Mm -hmm. But he met Someone pretty important to his life in Alabama, no? Yes, he (laughs) met Harper Lee. Wait, who's she? Harper Lee would go on to write To Kill a Mockingbird, and she wrote him into the story. He is the character of Dill, their their little weird neighbor boy. (laughs) (laughs) I think that he also wrote her into a story, is that right? Which one? I think it is Other Voices, Other Rooms. Okay. The character of Isabel is based on Harper Lee. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, they remained lifelong friends, although he would have a falling out with her as well towards the end of his life. Just about the same time he he committed social suicide with everyone he knew almost. Burned all those bridges. Totally (laughs) self-imposed, too. Oh, man. Truman. Truman would be super fun to have like a three martini lunch with at a like a fancy hotel restaurant. Mm-hmm. But I think he could be a challenging person to be friends with. Absolutely. As we'll see, he doesn't have a strong sense of loyalty. And I don't know that I blame him after a childhood like he had. Right. So <laughs> he, he spent his very young years living in Alabama. And he knew that he was a writer when he was about eight years old. He had a quote where he essentially said like how other kids would go home and play sports all afternoon. He would go home and write for three hours. Yep, very dedicated from a young age. He actually won a Scholastic Art and Writing Award in 1936 when he was like 12. That's amazing. Yeah. So he he spent his youngest years in Alabama meeting Harper Lee, running around, and they were sort of a, an odd couple. She was a tomboy. He was like me, an indoor kid. You know, mm-hmm. he was writing, but they became great friends, and it's, it's pretty incredible that they both grew up to be famous authors. Although for very different reasons, right? Harper Lee wrote like one great American novel. Mm -hmm. Technically two, but we don't count the second one. We don't? We don't. Why not? Because it's bad. Really? It's bad. I think we may need to do an episode on this. We probably should talk about (laughs) this, yeah. Um, Her posthumously published Ghost at a Watchman is Mm -hmm. not my favorite. Okay. Yeah. But he was a pretty prolific writer, on the other hand. He was for basically the first half of his life, and then essentially he kept getting 
contracts to write things, and he kept not fulfilling it. <laughs> that seems very Capote. <laughs> yeah. We need a... I think he was probably exhausting. Capote-esque. That's what we're going to call it. <laughs> but he also, I think, is a, a straight-up genius. And, mm-hmm. and I'll get into more why. But going back to his childhood, his mom got remarried when he was around 12 to a man in New York who was a lawyer and a businessman. His last name was Capote. He did not like this new stepdad, but the stepdad did adopt him. And so he did change his last name to Capote. He also changed his middle name. What did he change his middle name to? Garcia. His dad, his stepfather's name is Jose Garcia Capote. Mm -hmm. He was Cuban. Yeah. And he changed his name to Truman Garcia Capote. Okay. Yeah. Well, this... (laughs) <laughs> this this dad he he made a lot of money and so they did live the high life. Truman was sent to really prestigious boarding schools and prep schools. He had a really good education as a preteen to teenager. But again, <laughs> his mom did not have a great picker because this man went to prison for embezzlement. Because of the trauma of this, his mother did die by committing suicide. And he had had a really difficult relationship with his mother. Not only had she abandoned him when he was young, she was an alcoholic and she did not approve that he was gay and she would pick on him for what she saw as effeminate personality traits. Wow. I can only imagine how hard it would be for a man like Truman. He was openly gay, and Mm -hmm. this was a time where that was not okay. Being himself, it often brought bullying on him when he was a kid and when he was an adult, too. It still wasn't widely accepted, even in his New York circles. Right. So a little bit uh, later, after his, his teen years, he actually worked as a copy boy in the art department for The New Yorker. Yeah, what's fascinating is, I think it shows how brilliant he is, is that he never went to college right. to hone his innate writing skills. Mm-hmm. So straight out of high school, he got this job as a copy boy. Yeah. Now, he got fired from this job. Do you know how? It has something to do with Robert Frost, right? Yep. So basically, he met Robert Frost sort of... In passing, who was working as an editor at the time, I believe, Hmm. they just didn't have good chemistry. And I think Robert Frost didn't feel like he was getting the respect due to him by Capote. Mm. And so Capote was ordered to go to this Robert Frost reading, poetry reading. (laughs) But he legitimately had the flu that day. Oh. And they said, too bad you're going, or Mr. Frost will be very upset. So he went, but halfway through, he was going to faint. So he left, and Robert Frost made it happen that he was let go. Mm -hmm. Wow. But from there, he, you know, he worked his way up. Mm -hmm. He was great at making friends. And so he made his way into these New York circles of, you know, prestige and writers. And he was able to get his short stories that he was famous for into magazines. When he's still young, he does meet his lifelong partner, who was another writer. His name was Jack Dunphy. They met at a party in 1948, and they had a relationship for 35 years. Wow. It definitely was a tumultuous relationship, as... As all of them apparently are. <laughs> well, as we'll learn, <laughs> Truman definitely has substance abuse issues, mm-hmm. and he'd be in and out of rehab, and... Jack tried to be his rock, but he was in a relationship with an addict, so this was very difficult for him. Yeah. But they were together until Truman's death. And when did he die? He died in 1984, but he did some things before then. Okay. <laughs> uh, I have a quote that Mr. Capote said in 1978. So when he wasn't writing, he was just having a fantastic time being a personality. Oh. So he loved to go on talk shows. He loved to hold court. I think today he would be an influencer. Absolutely. Right? He would be, oh my gosh. <laughs> a he TikTok lo- personality. Loved attention. Loved attention. <laughs> yeah. He sounds like he would have been a ton of fun and really exhausting, like yeah, I said. exactly. But he always knew he was going to be a writer. He said in 1978 on a talk show, the thing about people like me is that we always knew what we were going to do. Many people spend half their lives not knowing. But I was a very special person. Oh, nice. And I had to have a very special life. I was not meant to work in an office or something, though I would have been successful at whatever I did. But I always knew I wanted to be a writer and that I wanted to be rich and famous. It's good to know that entitlement isn't just limited to millennials, right? I love him. (laughs) (laughs) I love the confidence. It's great. Yeah, so he wrote these short stories, and at the same time, he became a great friend with what he called his swans. Oof. And the swans were New York socialite women. Mm-hmm. He would be their best friends. Their husbands trusted him. Because he was gay, they weren't worried that they were going to run away with him. 
So pretty much it was like the only man who could hang out with him all the time. He also had some people he was not getting along with very well for a long time, right? He had a long time open feud with Gore Vidal. I didn't know this. Tell me about it. Oh, I don't know that much about it, except that he and Gore were very antagonistic toward each other. Really? Yeah. And what did Gore Vidal do? Uh, Gore Vidal is another writer. Capote said, <laughs> Capote said, I'm always sad about Gore. Very sad that he has to breathe every day. <laughs> So mean and so funny. Uh huh. I think that it started uh, because Truman Capote accused him of being thrown out of the White House for being drunk and insulting Mrs. Kennedy's mother. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and Gore Vidal said that that was slander. I love it. So, I love it. Yep. Oh, he he essentially is the mean popular. Yeah person from high school. Oh yeah, for sure. And you definitely want to be on their good side because they can get everyone against you. But even their good side is not safe. (laughs) No. (laughs) Do not trust Truman. Public service announcement. Do not trust Truman Capote. He probably has a burn book somewhere. Yes. (laughs) And as we'll find out, that burn book was called Lakote Basque. Okay, tell me about it. I'll jump ahead. He had all these wonderful socialite friends. He even threw a huge party in 1966 called the Black and White Ball. And he planned it for a year and a half. And he would carry around a notebook with his guest list on it. (laughs) And as his mood changed, he would cross things out. He would add people. (laughs) And I want to mention, I'm getting a lot of information from one of my favorite podcasts. A shout out to this podcast called Trashy Divorces. And I'm a Patreon because they had a whole series on Truman Capote. And uh, it's a delight. So I got a lot of information from them. But yeah, he would carry on this notebook and he would cross people out as his uh, as he had whims. <laughs> but he threw a huge party, black and white ball, and so the men wore black tuxes and women could wear black or white dresses and everyone had to wear a mask. Wow. Love it. And it was at times like these, because he always carried around a notebook like a writer, he would write down all of the secrets that his friends would tell him. So, so he's like Gretchen Wieners from Mean Girls. His hair was full of secrets. I was going to say he's like Harriet the Spy. So he basically was Harriet the Spy. Mixed with Gretchen (laughs) Wiener. Yes. That basically, (laughs) he knew everyone's dirt. Nice. And after being friends with these women for 20 years, so women like Gloria Vanderbilt, Mm -hmm. um, Babe Paley, who was married to the man who ran CBS. Wow. Like, if you think of all the famous women from the 60s, he was hanging on their yachts. (laughs) (laughs) So after being friends with all these women, and after being very famous after writing Brexit Tiffany's the novella, and then uh, he wrote In Cold Blood, which is pioneer of the genre, you might argue with me. I won't. Narrative nonfiction. So nonfiction book in the style of a novel. So one I think of most is like uh, Devil in the White City. Right. The interesting thing, though, is that we have In Cold Blood categorized as fiction, Whereas we have Devil in the White City categorized as nonfiction. Really? Yeah. And is it like that in most libraries? I'd have to look. It's interesting because there's a lot of accusations that In Cold Blood is not totally accurate. Hmm. Despite the fact that he did years of research on it. And just to give a quick rundown of In Cold Mm -hmm. Blood, it's based on his research going to Holcomb, Kansas. Kansas. After a slaying of a family by two men, and he became friends with the murderers and did a lot of research. And Harper Lee went with him. (laughs) Yes. I believe this is all laid out in the movie Capote, Mm -hmm. which I've ordered from the Community Library Network. Wow. (laughs) So he went there, but this whole process changed him as a person. I think that it sort of like, er, like messed up a wire in his brain. Okay. I buy that. It broke him. A little bit. um, Because he befriended these murderers, and he was there to see them get executed. Hmm. So after this, that's when he throws this big party. So he immediately finishes in cold blood, gets accolades. He's at the very pinnacle of his career. Then he throws this big party (laughs) where everyone loves and respects him. And then these publishers keep giving him advances that he's not following up on. Mm -hmm. And then about 
Uh, so this is 1966. Look Hope Bass comes out in the 70s. Look Hope yeah. Bass comes out in the 70s. And it basically what happened is that he was being hounded by the publishers. Like, we gave you advance money. You need to write something. And he went back to his old notebooks full of secrets. <laughs> and he wrote a thinly veiled short story called La Cope Basque, which is the name of a restaurant. Mm-hmm. And it's so thinly veiled. It would be like, this is a story about Roseanne. <laughs> And she lives in Schmidaho. It's basically a tell-all. Yeah, and some of the secrets are heartbreaking. Like, this one woman had shot her husband, Mm -hmm. but because her mother-in-law was so high up in Rhode Island society, she got her off the hook. Wait, her husband's mom got her off the hook for killing? Oh, okay. Girl, this is the whole thing. Yeah. So I think her name was Anne Woodward, I want to say. Um, So she had gotten off the hook pretty much through her mo- her mother-in-law's connections. But he, he writes about in the story like, oh yeah, and then Schman <laughs> shot her husband in the head. And three days after this story came out, Anne committed suicide. Mm. So Okay. Besides Consequences, that, folks. Besides, that was the, the most horrible thing to come out of this. But mm-hmm. other secrets, of course, were like infidelities. Just making fun of people. Like mm-hmm. saying... There, there's one like thinly veiled criticism of a couple who threw parties and he has the narrator say, oh, they threw a great party. If you've never been to a party before. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, he's so mean. So he basically blew up his entire social life. Mm-hmm. And then he from there basically spiraled and he died in 1984 due to alcoholism at age 59. Wow. One last thing I'll tell you. Okay. Is that. His cremated remains were sold at an auction in 2016 for $43,000. Wow. And this was through Christie's Auction House. And they were asking if, like, isn't this in poor taste? Mm-hmm. And the, the man who sold it was like, no, Truman would love this. Yes. This was his favorite thing. <laughs> I think that he would have. So we've talked a little bit about Truman Capote. Let's talk more about a novella, novelette. Novel? Let's talk about it. <laughs> now we know who wrote Breakfast at Tiffany's, which is what we're focusing on today. Are we? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Mostly I just want to gossip about Truman Capote. Yeah, I love it. Now you, you know the circumstances that he was writing this novella in and the set he was mingling in. Mm-hmm. So Breakfast at Tiffany's, the book, came out in 1958. I believe it had been serialized in magazines. Yeah, he sold it to Harper's Bazaar in 1958, and then they rejected it because of the language and they also thought that Tiffany's which was a huge advertiser for them uh, would react very poorly and it's funny because Tiffany's isn't really like even a thing in Breakfast at Tiffany's no not really no um but they were worried about the consequences of that so they rejected it they were worried about how Tiffany's would react so they decided to scrap it so then he resold it to Esquire for three thousand dollars, it was originally sold for two, and I don't know if he got to keep his two thousand and three thousand dollars. <laughs> I'm not sure, but very savvy of him if he did. But yeah, it was originally serialized in Esquire. Okay. Now this is a case where it is different than the movie. The movie is very famous mm-hmm. and iconic. Well, we can argue about that. I think something can be iconic without you liking it. Okay, that's that's fair. <laughs> well, I'll give you a brief <laughs> synopsis of the book. Okay. Huge difference right off the bat is that it takes place in 1943. So this is a wartime novel mm-hmm. written in 1958. And it starts, the framing device is that an unnamed narrator goes to uh, an old bar he used to frequent with a woman named Holly Golightly, who was a 19-year-old independent woman. Mm-hmm. that lived in the same building as his narrator. And so he's basically having a flashback to 1943 and remembering his times with her. And how does that start, the flashback? Because I think this is really interesting. So he's talking to this bartender named Joe Bell, who's a really big part of the novel, but not... Mm-hmm. A, not at I all a part of the movie. I think he hands him a drink. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're saying, oh, I haven't seen Holly. Then they found out that the narrator has a picture of an African wood carving that, that looks like Holly. That a villager made of holly because she's been traveling the world. Right. And they're like, oh, she must have been in Africa. There's no other possible explanation for this. And they're like, I remember holly. <laughs> Let me tell you all about her. Right. 
<laughs> Sit down. Pour me a beer. Yeah, essentially. Yeah, it starts really weird. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they talk about, so Holly Golightly is this 19-year-old who we find out is a, you call her a runaway? Basically. She's a Appalachian runaway who was married at 14 to like a 50-year-old and then ran away to New York. And many people say that she's a sex worker. People call her a call girl, but Truman Capote wants to be very clear about what her real job is. I have a good quote. Okay. So he was interviewed by Playboy in 1968. Because I think it is really unclear about what exactly she does for money. Yeah, I agree. I think that's intentional. No, he... Oh, he doesn't... He lays it out. Okay. 1968 interview with Playboy, Truman Capote addressed the question... Playboy, would you elaborate on your comment that Holly was the prototype of today's liberated female and representation of a whole breed of girls who live off men but are not prostitutes? They're our version of the geisha girl. Yes. I also saw someone call her American geisha. Then Capote said, Holly Golightly was not precisely a call girl. She had no job but accompanied expense account men to the best restaurants and nightclubs with the understanding that her escort was obligated to give her some sort of gift, perhaps jewelry or a check, If she felt like it, she might take her escort home for the evening. So these girls are the authentic American geishas, and they're much more prevalent now than in 1943 or 1944, which was Holly's era. Hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he's pretty clear about it. I find that interpretation fascinating. His own interpretation? His own interpretation. One of the reasons I think that's interesting is I always question authorial intent. I'm usually a person who, like, later on, if I find out that the author has said something different, I take that into account. My husband, on the other hand, is like, once it leaves Truman Capote's hands, he doesn't get to say anything about the novel anymore. Oh, it's the concept of death of the author. Yes, exactly. So there's there's different schools of thought. But I kind of think it's interesting when authors reinterpret their own work later on. Hmm. It colors my understanding of them. And I think that that's fascinating. Because this is a full 10 years after it was published mm-hmm. when he says this. Mm-hmm. So yeah, she's a 19-year-old, and what she does is she goes to fancy restaurants and then she says she's going to the powder room and she's always given at least fifty (laughs) dollars which in today's money is about eight hundred dollars so she'll say she's going to the ladies room and then she's expected to get a tip the ladies room (laughs) or cab fare which is also fifty dollars i think yeah so yes unclear maybe what she does for money Because another job is that she goes to sing sing prison and (laughs) she meets with a monster named sally tomato sally tomato see (laughs) and she gives him coded messages which are essentially i think like drug messages yeah i think he's a drug kingpin yeah she gives him the weather report (laughs) or she talks about like baseball scores yep so she's getting information from his lawyer mr shaughnessy Lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Holly Go Lightly, I'm going to throw this out there. I think she's the original manic pixie dream girl. Okay. From the book or from the movie? Both. Okay. And I'll get into it, but she's 19 in the book. Mm-hmm. A 19-year-old woman is very different than the 32-year-old Audrey, Audrey Hepburn, Hepburn of the movie. For sure. And what is a manic pixie dream girl? I just want to define this really yes, quick. Please tell me. It's a definition that, as the film critic Nathan Rabin, who coined it, said, bubbly, shallow, cinematic creature that exists solely in the fevered imaginations of sensitive writer directors to teach broodingly soulful young men to embrace life and its infinite mysteries and adventures. Mm-hmm. So, what are some other examples of manic pixie dream girls? Yeah, that would help. It was really popular in the mid 2000s. So mm-hmm. Natalie Portman in Garden State, mm-hmm. Zoe De Chanel in Five Hundred Days of Summer is a pinnacle manic pixie dream girl. Okay, I actually think that that one's interesting because I think they know that she's a manic pixie dream girl and they intentionally try to subvert that. Okay. Okay. I actually think a better example is Zoe De Chanel in Yes Man. I've seen that. Yes. Yeah. And yes, she's yes, ma'am. <clears throat> yes, I've seen that. I love her in that movie. What she do in that movie? That's manic and pixie and manic girl. and pixie. I mean, she has zero ambitions or goals or anything of herself. Um, Jim Carrey comes along and kind of sweeps her off her feet, but in this weird alt world where he's decided to say yes to everything and. She's basically just another thing he's saying yes to Mm -hmm. without having any, like, real sorts of intentions at all. The way I interpret it, it's usually, like, a depressed or just boring dude who meets up with a really interesting, fun girl. And I don't think he usually deserves her. No. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Oh, another perfect example is Clementine from The Eternal Sunshine of a Spotless Mind. So all Jim Carrey movies (laughs) must have a manic (laughs) If he's If he's not being... 
crazy. He needs uh, like a crazy lady to take okay. my adventures. <laughs> Great. So, and like this, she is sort of this party girl and the narrator is enthralled with her. And in the book, it's not clear, but you can insinuate that the narrator is gay. He does fall in love with her, but he says he falls in love with her in the way that when he was a child, he would fall in love with somebody's aunt or the right. mailman. Yeah. <laughs> so it's more of a platonic love. Sure. And at the end of this book, uh, after she gets arrested for helping Sally Tomato, she moves to <laughs> Brazil. And the cat that she had in her possession, who she never gave a name because... She didn't feel like anyone should belong to anyone else. The narrator takes care of her cat, and it's pretty realistic. He doesn't see her again. Yeah, and that feels like real life. Sometimes you meet people, and they change your life profoundly, and then disappear. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And because she's 19, it feels like the sort of friendship you have when you're 19, Mm -hmm. and you have an apartment for the first time, and you sit out on your front stoop. Sure. And you hang out with the other people who are on the front stoop. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) One thing that I love, because I watched the movie first several years ago, and I am not a fan. I I don't mind saying it's not my favorite movie. It's not even up there (laughs) anywhere close to the top of the list. So I did not think that I was going to enjoy the novella, but I actually thought that the writing was very beautiful. Oh, he's a beautiful writer. Yeah. And uh, I actually thought the story was a lot more interesting as well. Agreed. Yeah. I think because you get more interior knowledge of the narrator and more of a point of view, whereas I feel like the movie is more of just like window dressing. Truman Capote would agree with you. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. But I, I ended up really loving the novella to yeah, my utter surprise. And, and a lot of the movie dialogue is taken directly from the book mm-hmm. because it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. I do love when they're at Tiffany's and, or I don't even know if they're at Tiffany's in the book, but she has a quote about diamonds and Holly says, it's tacky to wear diamonds before you're 40 and even that's risky. They only look good on the really old girls. Wrinkles and bones, white hair and diamonds. I can't wait. (laughs) So Ryan, my husband, if you're listening, um, on my 40th birthday, I will be expecting some bling. Yep. Okay. (laughs) All right. Should we talk about the movie some? Yeah. And just before we do move on, I just Mm -hmm. want to say, still an incredibly popular novella. 30,000 copies of the book are still sold every single year. Wow. It's got some staying power. Yeah. Yeah, Let's move on to the movie. It It came out in 1961. It was directed by Blake Edwards. He also directed the Pink Panther movies. And he's married to Julie Andrews. Or was before he passed away. Oh, Yeah. Oh, he he also directed Victor Victoria, which makes sense because she was in that. Mm -hmm. The screenplay was nominated for the best screenplay, and the man who wrote it also wrote The Manchurian Candidate and The Seven Year Itch. Wow. Which makes sense. Yeah. 360s. It stars Audrey Hepburn and (sighs) George Poupard, who sucks. I have not felt this strongly about a miscasting. Oh, wow. Who is your perfect stand? I guess we'll tell you in the movie his name is Paul. Varjak. Yeah. So who would be your perfect Paul Varjak? I really thought about this. It's 1961. Um, I don't know. A piece of stale bread would do better. <laughs> Literally anyone else. Okay. First off, George Rupert. <laughs> Didn't even really want to be in this movie. And okay. everyone, cast and crew, even beautiful, lovely Audrey Hepburn, who <laughs> everyone loved, mm-hmm. didn't like him. They have zero chemistry. Okay, yep. He is, like, if some vanilla yogurt was sentient <laughs> and was given a, a movie star role, okay. this is George Papard. Okay. I'm going to call him Vanilla Paul for the rest of the... Oh, I hate him so much. <laughs> for the rest of this cast. He does not deserve to be in the same scenes with Audrey Hepburn. <laughs> Who is beautiful in this movie. Yeah. She's 32 years old. She just had a child three months before. Oh. This was a wow. this was a really hard role for her because it was really different than what she usually did. She mm-hmm. was nervous about playing a so-called call girl. Right. But she was not Truman Capote's choice to play Holly Golightly. No. He did not want her. He wanted, he really wanted Marilyn Monroe. Mm-hmm. But Marilyn Monroe's acting coaches said that, you know, it wouldn't be good for her reputation to play a call girl. Yeah. What the, the term that they used that I found was lady of the evening. <laughs> they thought that that would be very bad for her career. Yeah. Shirley MacLaine almost played her. Which I I love. That would be tiny really... Shirley MacLaine. I actually would have loved that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was apartment era Shirley MacLaine. She would have been right. delightful. Yep. Audrey Agreed. Hepburn is, is lovely and beautiful, but I don't think she's Holly Golightly. No. 
this is a different person. Yep, I agree. <laughs> Especially <laughs> because she has a European accent because she's mm-hmm. from, from Belgium. She's also a World War II survivor, by the way. Mm-hmm. There is actually a really wonderful biopic about Audrey Hepburn's life starring Jennifer Love Hewitt. That what? Is, yeah, it's well worth the watch. It was made for TV. It's really good. Okay, okay. I can buy that. I weirdly love Jennifer Love Hewitt, even though she's I great. feel like she's meh as an actress. Yeah, but she's she's lovely. I'm okay. trying not to okay. say charming anymore. Okay. We're, we're going to quickly run out of lovelies as well, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so her name's originally Lula May, and she only trusts her brother Fred, and so she calls men in her life Fred because of this trauma. And um, so she's, a, yeah, she's supposed to be a runaway. And they cover up for the fact that she doesn't have a Southern accent by um, the man in the movie who gives some exposition in the beginning was supposedly her Hollywood agent. He tried to get her to go do a screen test and at the last minute. She said, I don't want to. <laughs> but he said he spent a whole year trying to smooth out that Southern accent by giving her French lessons. And now you mm-hmm. can't tell. I'm like, yeah. Okay. Okay. OJ. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. His name's OJ. <laughs> So tell me a little bit about why it's different. What's different between this and the novella? Yeah. Well, the biggest ones are her age. Okay. A 19-year-old woman is different than a 32-year-old woman. Okay. She is mean in the book. Mm Mm-hmm. She is not a pleasant person. No. By any means. In the movie, she's beautiful Audrey Hepburn and very supportive Mm -hmm. and present when she's with people and encouraging uh in the book yeah I mean she's she's running around doing her own thing and Mm -hmm. and I don't know if I necessarily think in the book if she knows that what she's doing is wrong I'm mostly thinking of like the Sally Tomato passing the information Mm -hmm. I can't honestly put my finger on how naive or how understanding she is because she's 19 so i have no idea if she knows that she's passing drug information Mm -hmm. or not and similarly in the book i don't know if she understands how her actions affect other people or cares or cares but i i a lot of that i put down to her being 19 and not really knowing the way of the world yet Right. And so that's why I feel like a 32-year-old by then knows Mm -hmm. more about how I think people just get, I think you get a lot nicer Mm -hmm. from 19 to 32. I hope you do. (laughs) Because you you begin a little more empathy in how the world works. I hope to God I'm nicer than I was when I was 19. (laughs) But I think a lot of the way she acts is because of her background. And there was a part in the book, and you know I'm a robot, but I cried because you realize how broken and lost this girl is. Mm-hmm. She's um, kind of towards the end of the book, and she's saying how many, not men, people she slept with. Mm-hmm. She says 11, but I'm only counting from after 13 because nothing before that counts. Right. And that just That line me. is awful. I stopped, and I was like, oh, my God. God, so, Mm -hmm. like, what has she been through? Right. And she gets married when she's 14. Right, to a guy who claims he wants to, like, take care of her and have her, like, take care of his kids, but Mm -hmm. she cannot be that much older than his kids, first of all. Mm -hmm. And he comes and tracks her down in New York City. Mm -hmm. And what boggles my mind in the book and the movie is that he first finds Paul, or the unnamed narrator Mm -hmm. first, and he tells him this. He says, well, I know that you say a a person can't know their mind at 14, but you don't know Lula May. Right. So he's like, so I had this child bride. (laughs) She was totally okay to give consent about this. Mm -hmm. And Paul's like, right this way, sir. Yeah, right. I don't know if she wants to see you or she's hiding from you, but come on in. Let's knock on that door. Yeah, terrible. The movie ends differently. Ugh. (laughs) Blech. That's all I can say. <laughs> so in this movie, oh, another major difference is that Paul is also a sex worker. Mm-hmm. So in the book, he has not yet published a novel. He's a struggling writer. In the movie, he's published a book already called Nine Lives. Ha ha ha. She has a cat. Right. Oh, it's oh, oh, Holly like funny. a cat. <laughs> oh my goodness. The mercy. And he is a kept man mm-hmm. by an older woman, a rich older woman in the apartment in the building that Holly lives in. Right. And I love basically, the, he doesn't write in it. He no. he always thinks he should write, or he Holly being the manic pixie dream girl inspires him to start writing again. There's a really great scene. This is like the only time I think there's a really great scene hmm. in this whole movie. Uh, right at the beginning, where she has climbed up the fire escape to Paul's apartment, and she's going to let herself in, and she sees his uh, patroness. I'm going to call her, <laughs> let herself out, but she 
puts money on the table, and then walks out of the apartment. I was pretty surprised for 1961 right? how brazen this is. Sans robes <laughs> in bed. Yeah. And she's leaving money by the, yeah. by the bed. Yeah. So Holly walks in there and is pouring drinks that are right next to the thing. And she, I think she just looks at it and counts, but she counts the money and she's like, well, $300. I understand exactly. And I think that that's such a great, interesting line for yeah. her. Like, it's like, I see you. We are cut from the same cloth. Yeah, exactly. And then they become friends, and then they go to the public library, (laughs) and the librarian would get a D from me in reference service abilities, because she's mean to them. She's horrible. You should always be very nice and smile and be interested in what you're doing. Yes, I agree. (laughs) She shushes them. Well, then they do write an inscription in his book, Mm -hmm. and she gets really mad. The librarian? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) She's like, that's public property. (laughs) Right. Whereas on the other hand, in the book, he sees her go into a library and follows her. And And he's like, I can't imagine her going to a library. Yeah. And he even says it to her later. He was like, I'm just surprised you were reading. And she was like, I can read. (laughs) (laughs) I know things. Exactly. (laughs) I am not an idiot. Thank you. But yeah, I love that about it. The other scene that I think is good because it does gut me at the end of that movie is when she like stops the cab throws the cat out she's like i don't belong to it and it doesn't belong to me go get out and like throws it out into the rain and i'm such a softy i like start bawling (laughs) audrey hepburn audrey hepburn cried because she didn't want to it's so mean hurt the cat yeah but there's like this great shot of like there's little fence and the cat's little face is like peeking out behind the bars (laughs) oh my god See, I did cry because uh, yeah. it's an animal. Mm-hmm. It was just one cat. In the credits in the beginning. It just says cat. Yeah, it yeah. says cat. And then it also says Miss Beverly Hills. What? Yeah, one of the cast members is just Miss Beverly Hills in the very beginning. I didn't catch that. I'm going to have to do some research on Yeah, that. I would like to know about that. But the main difference is that they are romantically involved. Mm-hmm. And at the end, instead of what would probably happen, is that she goes off to Brazil to, you know, keep working as a woman. Or or escape federal charges for drug trafficking. Oh, that too. That too. (laughs) Yeah. Is that they kiss in the rain and it's romantic. There is not a world where they will stay together more than two weeks. No. And also their kiss is awful. Because he sucks. Uh, Yeah. It's like you would kiss an aunt at Christmas that you haven't seen for like five years and your mom's like... Go kiss auntie, sweetheart. Mm-hmm. That's that's the kind of kissing that oh happens. Oh my god, in this. they have zero chemistry. None. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> can I give you sort of the rundown of my stream of consciousness as I was watching the movie? Yeah. Can we also talk very quickly about Mickey Rooney in this? Oh my gosh. Oh, I just think we. It oh, needs, it's so upsetting. It bears mentioning. Well, I actually have this in my rundown. Okay. Okay. So the first thing I write because I'm doing my speech to text voice notes. Beautiful opening of the movie of her looking at Tiffany's and eating the beautiful, because it's Givenchy, who she Mm -hmm. worked with on her other movies, dress, and you have this beautiful opening, and then you get a horrible yellow face impression Mm -hmm. by Mickey Rooney as Mr. Yunioshi. It's beyond insulting. And everyone who made the movie went on to say they were really embarrassed by this. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, Extremely. I mean, it can't be more offensive. And what I think makes it worse is that he's the comic relief in this. Like, this character doesn't even need to exist in the movie. No. He's only there for humor. Comic relief, yeah. In the book, he's the the neighbor. She always, like, brings his door. He's the landlord. He, like, owns the building. I don't think he's the landlord. I think he's just a neighbor. Just a neighbor. She bugs him. Okay. Because he's actually a respected worldwide traveler photographer. And he's really respected. And he's a very serious artist. And... There is also a comment being made that, like, this is during World War II mm-hmm. in the book when they're fighting the Japanese. And right. this is a Japanese man who it has made it to, like, the pinnacle of right. high society in New York in the 40s. There's also a really great line in the book um, where someone makes a disparaging comment because he's Japanese. And the narrator's like, he's from California. <laughs> You're right. Which is, like, such a great line for yeah. that time period. I'm like, Capote? A plus. Yeah. There you go. Holly, on the other hand, it super nope. racist. Yep. Bad. <laughs> in the in the book. Big yikes. She does say a lot of homophobic things yep. as well. Mm-hmm. Is it in the book or the movie that she does say like love is love and I oh, know it must be in the book. You think it's in the book because she says, "Can you imagine?" Um, oh no, I totally uh, you marrying a, a man. She said, "I don't care." Yeah. 
<laughs> Which, of course, it's Capote writing it. Right. But it sounded so modern mm-hmm. from a, a book from 1958. And that's another reason I think I liked the book so much more than I liked the movie is there were several things in it that I was like, wow, for a person writing in the 50s, Mm -hmm. this is very contrary to my expectations. But yeah, I just thought that that was a a really great book. And again, Mm -hmm. with the characters having like a more platonic sort of relationship instead of falling in love, I thought that was great. Yeah, it just, it didn't matter in the book who what sexuality was who. Right. Um, Yeah. Like they just, it's a platonic pure love. Yes, exactly. So can I just give you some thoughts and feelings I had about the movie? Yeah, I want to know the wrapping rest. Up? Go for it. <laughs> oh, horrible Mickey Rooney. Yeah. So everyone was embarrassed about this characterization. And he was at first initially. And then by the time Mickey Rooney was way older, yep. he just rewrote history. And he was like, I think I did a great job. Yep. And I know a lot of people who said I was hilarious. Yes. I've never heard one complaint. <laughs> Like, okay. Okay, Mickey. Okay, Mickey Rooney. I could do an entire podcast about him. Funny. You see her at first. She's sleeping, not necessarily off a hangover, but she's sleeping during the day because she works at night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she has an amazing sleep mask and earplugs. And I thought about you mm-hmm. because in Big Little Lies, mm-hmm. the end scene, they're at a Audrey Hepburn Oh, yeah, the, the trivia night. Yeah, and so everyone has, dresses. in Big Little Lies, everyone dresses as Audrey Hepburn, and yep. Reese, Reese Withers- Witherspoon. Reese Witherspoon dresses as her wearing the, she gets earrings that look like the tasseled earplugs. Yes. And amazing slate mask. Yeah. Oh, it's so great. It's very good. I wrote, George Papard has a personality of a brick, and she talks about getting the mean reds. Yeah. She's just describing anxiety. Right. Because she says the blues are when you're getting fat or it's raining, but the mean reds are like something else. I'm like, girl, it's just anxiety. Right. The mean blues was actually like a thing. Mean blues? Yeah. Or just so she No, the mean blues. They talk about it. She goes, you know the mean blues, but this is different. This is the mean reds. And I actually think that back in the day, mean blues was a euphemism for depression. And mm-hmm. this is more a euphemism for anxiety. Mm-hmm. Very fascinating. The Blue Meanies or the Beatles did movies. They're increasingly bad as they get more and more drug addled. And one of them, they have these characters attacking and they're called the Blue Meanies. What is this from? The Beatles movie, uh, oh, Yellow yeah, Submarine. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's very bad. Watch it sometime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to give you another quote from Jeremy Capote about Holly Golightly. He, you know, he liked Audrey Hepburn. He mm-hmm. invited her to that big party. But she was not his Holly Golightly. Hashtag not my Holly right? Golightly. He said... Holly Golightly was real, a tough character, not an Audrey Hepburn type at all. The film became a mawkish valentine to New York City and Holly. And as a result, was thin and pretty, whereas it should have been rich and ugly. Ooh. Whew. I love that. Also, it makes me think of what you said about the movie. You and Truman Capote would have been Mm -hmm. on the same page. Yeah. I think we should mention real quickly that in 2012, this movie got preserved in the Library of Congress's National Film Registry, which is for influential films throughout the ages that they believe are worthy of being preserved. And of course, the ubiquitous poster that is on, at least when I was in my day... (laughs) In 2007, <laughs> every single girl I knew, including myself, had an Audrey Hepburn Brooks at Tiffany's poster in her dorm room. Oh, okay. Another random fact, Paramount, who is the studio, mm-hmm. they didn't want to call her call girl. So in all the advertising for it, they called her a kook, K-O-O-K. And in a press release, they said, a kook is a kitten who will never grow up to be a cat. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to wrap it up. One more thing. Henry Mancini wrote Moon River, which mm-hmm. won the Oscar for Best Original Song, and they wanted to cut it, and Audrey Hepburn said, over my dead body. <laughs> they did it because she has a very bad singing range. <laughs> no, I'm serious. <laughs> oh, they wrote it in that They wrote key? it in that key because she is not a great singer. She's not a singer. Yeah. Well, thank you for letting me rant about positivities <laughs> and Truman Capote. Sure. And... Everything that we've mentioned today can be found at the Community Library Network here mm-hmm. in North Idaho. Absolutely. Please visit our website, communitylibrary.net, to find all of your books and movies and other adaptations. And try to be nicer today than Truman Capote. But try to be just as witty as him. <laughs> Advice to live by. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us on The Book Isn't Necessarily Better. I'm Michaela, And I'm Roxanne. We'll see you next time. I know, I know.
know. I'm so excited. Okay. I am too. I do think we need to move on just a little bit, though. It's I... 56. Totally. Yes. We've talked a little bit about Truman Capote. I'm sorry. I totally went off the rails. It's okay. I think it was fun. Was that my Nancy Drew? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> See how calm I am about that and how rational. So chill.